Welcome to Wednesday, May 2nd. It is hardware, security, right? And crypto. And crypto. I don't think yeah. it's May 2nd. It's not May 2nd? Not for Wednesday. Yeah. I thought today was the first. Tuesday's the first. Oh, never mind. Continue as planned. <laughs> YouTube comments. Oh, you and your gaslighting. I, 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 I could have <laughs> sworn today was the first, but I was wrong. <laughs> Uh, this is a follow-up. iOS 11.3.1 fixes that thing where third-party screen repairs made the iPhone 8 touchscreen stop working. So apparently Apple is taking a little bit of heat because if you used a quote-unquote not genuine touchscreen, meaning the original OEM touchscreen, somehow they could tell the difference and they made touch stop working. I think they still made their point. They got a huge benefit from this because they scared people into thinking... If I do third-party repairs, it can be inconvenient for me. So yeah. didn't really cost them anything, and now they can be like, oh, we didn't really mean to do that. We'll fix it. See, we're always going to fix it. I think this is a win-win for Apple. <laughs> See, we're always going to fix it. So you should just bring it to the Apple store anyway exactly. and let us right. fix it for real. I really like the note. Non-genuine replacement displays may have compromised visual quality and may fail to work correctly. Apple certified screen repairs are performed by trusted experts who use genuine Apple parts. We went through this trusted 100 years ago with automobiles, and it's BS. It's like the same. I mean, you could totally buy a cheap, crappy screen if you want to. What business is it of Apple's if I want to put a cheap, crappy <laughs> screen in my phone? Uh, they're basically saying, don't buy those cheap Chinese knockoffs. Well, guess who's making them for Apple? <laughs> Well, definitely you, not those same people. Yeah. You could definitely get the Now it's it's interesting because we had the other story the other day about the the repair guy, the the guy that was doing the repairs at the screens in Europe or whatever, and Apple has since started putting the Apple logo on all of the parts that go into their phone, and I think the reason they're doing that is so that they can say, well, when you're buying the parts without the Apple logo, those parts are, you know, counterfeit or whatever. It's an interesting argument to make because trade laws may actually protect that in in that narrow case but with like the automobile repair laws that at least in the u.s that kind of behavior is already illegal for automobiles so it'll be interesting to see if we can get that to a plot of phones people don't understand it the same way i think the i'm sort of a big proponent of right to repair and not to ramble or anything but uh lewis rossman did a video on 10 years of apple repairs and it was great because it was like here's all the engineering problems with it so I wonder what sort of engineering problems Apple is going to have when they're working on a powerful wireless headset for both VR and AR. There, there's going to be so many because they say that you don't need to set up anything in your room. Like, there's all kinds of things that they say, oh, it's not going to be like other VR things. But they don't. This, this our whole article reads like it was written by a PR person and not a 8K displays for both eyes. Tech person. At no all. wires. Yeah. And you got to wonder. What kind of battery life is it going to have? It's driving two 8K displays. They do talk about the, uh, they plan to have the processing going on in a separate box and super fast wireless moving between the two. But it if you're totally doing, totally won't cause brain cancer. If you're doing gaming, is the latency going to be an issue? There's a <laughs> lot of questions about this plan. Uh, you're just going to go to the Apple store in virtual reality and look at their showroom. That's what it's for. <laughs> The Cupertino, California company has dabbled in smaller VR projects, but the headset marks a major investment in VR. I just... And I this just... CNET, they really cheerlead this thing. And they, they go into the fact that VR has not taken off the way anybody expected it to. Well, I'm, a lot of people didn't expect it to take off, and they've been proved correct. But uh, they say that that's all going to change, because in the next couple of years... Totally going to be the world of VR. Just get ready for it. Or it's augmented so reality. It's right now. Or both. The thing. Well, what do you think this is going to cost? Two oh. 8K displays, all wireless. This is going to be like $5,000 at least. How much is like the Oculus or the Vive? They're like 1000 bucks. Like no. 500 to 1000 Yeah. Well, yeah. You, can, you can get started with about 600 I think. But yeah, you still so, need the computer. Yeah. So. And that's still, you know, pretty cost prohibitive for most people. So what if, you know, hypothetical scenario here, because that's what we're all about, level one, right? What if... Uh, Apple comes out with something that looks kind of like Google Glass, but projects using lasers or whatever, an 8K display onto the back of your retina. Do you think that people will, just for the, like the, the, the social stigma of having the headgear, do you think that people, it's like, oh yes, I'm very cool, look at my cool, you know. Just I, like Google Glass? Yeah, Apple eyeglass. I mean, isn't that. Apple 
if anyone could pull that kind of crap off, I would say it would be Apple, because people did the same thing with like Apple watches. Like they're they're very you know keen to show off that they've got the the branded. You know, in Fifth Element, when that guy's wearing like the plastic headgear where like his hair's sticking out a little bit, what if Apple does something like completely over the top like that, where they're like, yeah, we're making a fashion statement. Here's you know, you wear your plastic headgear and you know you look like the guy from the Fifth Element, and that's your AR. Well, think about Beats headphones. Beats headphones, people really do just like wear them around all day long because mm. they think that's cool, or at least they used to. The problem is that kind of fashion is so fickle. It changes mm-hmm. rapidly. And you're going to need this to be like a five-year product cycle. <laughs> so what happens when people are it's like, oh, that's not cool anymore. Uh, you switch from aluminum to space gray. That's what you do. Yeah, you, you change <laughs> new color options, you know, new prints. Well, I guess you incorporate RGB. and That's then, what I was going to say, lights. Yeah. You replace your normal mechanical switches with these new butterfly switches that malfunction if they get a piece of dust in them. I can already see like the ads where it's like, Here's the old one that's just matte gray. And then here's the new one. Then it like lights up and it animates the light as it goes around. And you know, it plays some cool music in the background. But and then it's like Apple, whatever again, year it's released. An 8K directly to the retina projector. How long are those batteries going to last? Apply directly to the retina. That's ridiculous. <laughs> and other big hardware news this week. Uh, Jim Keller has been hired by Intel. So, uh, he, you know, a lot of headlines say that he's AMD's former Zen chief and, you know, he's going to work for Intel and Intel. And, and as we'll see, you know, Intel and their earnings call this week, ooh, they, they got some problems. But it seems like Intel is going to have Jim Keller work on system on chip and embedded solutions, which is similar to what he was working on for Tesla. It makes sense. I think Intel, we know with the whole Zen thing that Intel never expected to be out of the catbird seat and they weren't really worried about innovation you know it's like we control innovation you we will upgrade on our schedule we are the innovation and so now they are headhunting to try and of course it's going to be a a development cycle they're not going to reap the benefits now but they're sort of they've seen the tea leaves and it's like we have to do something let's go out there and get the talent so that we can eventually get back control of this Intel had their earnings call this week, and they announced some really, really major things. A lot of people are picking up on this, but, you know, Tom's Hardware has the article, you know, from that earnings call, Ten, the Intel's 10 nanometer is broken. On the call, they said, we're just not getting the yields that we need out of 10 nanometers, which means they don't have enough working processors coming off of silicon. They don't really know why, uh, I guess, I, you know, it's, it's sort of intimated. They announced that they're restructuring their manufacturing and engineering group, and so part of these, these new high, it's not just... You know, Jim Keller, you also remember that Roger Coduri came over and they're incorporating Vega GPUs onto Intel chips and maybe some other stuff. Maybe Intel's doing its own GPU. So there's a lot of crazy stuff happening at Intel. And Intel has got a lot of disposable income to be able to do this kind of stuff. They're also, I think the thing that saved them is they're still talking about not focusing their entire business on CPU and you know, processor. They are getting into the big data game. They're getting into, well, we talked about graphics. That's sort of the same thing. And they're trying to branch out, but you wonder if they're hemorrhaging money at the core there, how good are they going to be at branching out? Yeah. And, you know, flipping to the other side, you know, their competition with AMD, AMD doesn't have its own foundry. It doesn't have its own manufacturing process. It relies on TSMC and Global Foundries to do their manufacturing. And so... AMD right now is getting seven nanometer Zen 2 samples, you know, this year, right now, today, from uh, their uh, foundry partner for for their CPU. So right now, today, seven nanometer technology is being produced by foundries other than Intel, which means that they're basically a process ahead of Intel at this point if Intel is delaying their 10 nanometer process until 2019. So in general, that's very bad news. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to see Zen 2 this year. This is just, it's going to take them, like, if there's a problem with this, it would take them at least three months to do another respin and correct the problems and do testing and that kind of thing. But we're also seeing Radeon Instinct GPUs as well on the 7 nanometer process. And this is not, you know, like AMD engineering. This is Global Foundries and TSMC doing these types of process improvements. Yeah, Intel did mention they are switching lithography after this next run too. So that's, I guess that's a bit of a Hail Mary. Yeah. Because if that fails, 
then what are they going to do? You can't really outsource that because everybody else is doing it a different way. The the seven ten thing, there's some semantics in there. Yeah, it's not really seven versus ten. So you think, oh well, seven's so much better, but it's not something that Intel can just be like, well, we failed at this. Let's let them do it. It's not going to work <laughs> like that. If they fail, Intel's only option would be to like try to buy Global Foundries or TSMC or something. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I just don't see that. Uh, I, too many, a lot of people use Global Foundries and TSMC for their chip production, and I just don't see it. I just don't see it happening. I mean, right? AMD even tweeted a picture. They were like, "Look at this. We got seven nanometer Vega Radeon Instinct GPUs in the test lab." And this is kind of important because you know AMD, you know, as much as I love them, they're behind. A little bit on the AI side of things. Their their GPUs have got the raw compute power, but in terms of like AI library performance and you know uh, scientists to buy in that are, that are using these kinds of things for AI applications, it's not there. So they need the performance boost from the process improvement that you'd sort of get automatically in order to be competitive in that market. I think. It's certainly, why not spend this time? perfecting your AI GPU market when all of your gaming GPUs are already sold before yeah. you make them. Because right? <laughs> of cryptocurrency. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, the, only, the only sort of, uh, what, what do you call it when the, uh, it's the opposite of a black cloud with a silver lining? A silver lining with a tiny black cloud? No, that's not how No, that... it's a silver cloud with a black lining. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't think there's a word for that. There's. 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 It got, probably isn't German. It's, it's gotta probably be, really long too. Got to be something. Extreme Tech has this article, and it says AMD is moving their seven nanometer GPU production back to TSMC from Global Foundries. So AMD is in kind of a cool position here. They've got Global Foundries and TSMC that are both doing silicon production for them, and it seems like they get to play the two companies a little bit off of off of one another. I mean, I don't get that it's like super intense, like. AMD's yelling at Global Foundries. It's like, you guys are worthless. Look at what TSMC can do for us. Oh, my God. And then going to TSMC and be like, wow, Global Foundries has promised all this stuff. I don't think it's like that at all. I think they're trying to be a good partner with both companies. But I do think it's interesting that there are signs that AMD is, you know, shaking up what they're doing with 7 nanometer. Well, they do mention that they have an agreement with Global Foundries. And because they're not letting Global Foundries do all of the fabrication, they may actually have to end up paying a fine. Yeah. For every unit that goes to TSMC. But they do talk about Global Foundries just simply can't get the 7 nanometer stuff up to speed fast enough. And it makes sense. AMD, they would be stupid not to just keep hitting Intel with release after release. Because <laughs> you think they've the last two, three releases, they've totally eclipsed anything that Intel's done. Yeah. So, yeah, w- when you're ahead, get more ahead. <laughs> just yeah, don't slow down. Just keep going. Keep yeah. clawing at it and maybe you'll maybe you'll, you will get somewhere. And I think that uh I think it probably I don't think that Jim Keller will be at the helm. Maybe I could be wrong. I think in, Jim Keller's going to go for the system on chip thing like I said, but I think that Intel does have to look at their core microarchitecture and try to develop the next microarchitecture. But that's a 5-year process. Like they have to get their butt in gear and whatever they do right now today, it's not going to pay off for about five years. So it could be a really, really crazy situation when we're looking at it in 2023. In, in, in other news, WFCC tech, cause you know, they're leaking things. Uh, and it's like AMD Ryzen desktop, 21, 23 and 2500 X. So these are more CPUs. Maybe and Ryzen mobile, the 2800 U oh, there's the, there's where the 2800 went an ultra low voltage. CPU and also the one that I'm waiting for, the Threadripper 2950X. Man, if they could take the 2700X and just put two of those in one package and call it a day, I would be so happy. So it's a leak. Take it for what it's worth. This, these are things that are saying this is ready for mass market. So presumably these are in mass production or nearing mass production, but we don't actually know because rumor and WFCC tech and all that. So take that with a grain of salt. And that's it for hardware news. In security this week, police have taken down the world's largest DDoS for hire. We've actually talked about this service a couple of times in the past. Apparently it is a global operation. I was like, where's this based out of? And it's like, got places in the UK, US, Australia, Hong Kong, all over the place. Brian Krebs reckons it's uh, Jovan Merkovic, a 19-year-old Serbian, that's running the whole thing. But they, they had servers everywhere. They had administrators everywhere. 
This was a big business. And you could get your DDoS starting at $15. Well, that's reasonable. Very reasonable. I would pay that. And of course, it went up. To, I'm sure you could pay as much as you wanted to get as much damage as you wanted done. And uh, no more. So I guess that's good news. <laughs> Got some other good news for you. If you like wreaking havoc and with a USB stick that can blue screen any Windows machine when you plug it in, uh, here's some proof of concept code that will trigger an instant BSOD on all recent Windows versions. It stems from a bug in the way that the operating system handles NTFS, but Microsoft doesn't really think it's critical because you have to have physical access to cause the problem. I think it's kind of a big deal. I mean, that seems significant. Like, that would be a problem. I don't think it's... It, it, you could weaponize it. Like, sometimes you could turn a blue screen into, like, a, something that takes over the machine. I don't think they figured out how to do that. So, I guess it just crashes your machine. But still, like, kiosks and terminals and things like that. It's like, oh, you plug a USB stick in. It's like, oh, it crashes the machine. Don't do that. But it's still... It's kind of funny that the operating system is that fragile. You know what else is fragile? Ski lifts that are open to the internet. Yeah. There's a... It's... I'm going to say it's hilarious, and I know I think it's funny. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, but there's a video of people being thrown off of a ski lift on YouTube. It's not this ski lift, but that's what caused these researchers to say, wait a minute, we should look into ski lifts and see how, what, you know, what's going on. The one in the video, it was a mechanical failure. But these guys that same day found a ski lift in Austria that the all the controls, the speed, the distance between the cars, the tension on the cable. Which I didn't know they could control so many variables there. Pretty cool, right? And that was just open on the internet. There's Anybody the control. Can do it. Like, just... can you, like, how low can tension be? Like, can can you make so they're dragging their asses on the ground or? Well, you know, start looking for open ski lifts <laughs> and we'll experiment. <laughs> the internet of ski lifts. There was not even a password on this, which is Ooh. the scariest part. It's like. What are you log? What's the password? Ski lift. Oh, okay, yeah, sounds good. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I'm never going skiing again because that's something I do often. <laughs> but yeah, they they took the ski lift immediately down and fixed it. But of course, where there's one, there's probably a lot more. And <laughs> what if, brand was that? If you see that the mechanical failure video, it is just launching people off that ski lift, and I'm sure some people got hurt. But man, it's it's like a sort of a Three Stooges kind of funny. It's the Black Diamond. You know, you, you're going from the the bunny slope to just straight. <laughs> <laughs> the, difference, the difference in that video being hilarious and horrific is entirely in the soundtrack. It's it, you've got the you know the Laurel and Hardy like you know uh, saloon piano going on. It's really funny. Bunny Hill. The, yeah, you got the screaming you know <laughs> people screaming in terror. Suddenly not not very funny. But how many first time skiers do you think that caught? Like <laughs> oh, okay, I'm gonna get on the lift and I'm actually gonna go down a hill. A lot of people, it seemed like they were really struggling. And of course, you know, when they're coming up the hill, they see the carnage and they have time to get ready. Oh, no. <laughs> but they just couldn't deal with it once they got there. There's a new C Sharp uh, ransomware that compiles itself at runtime. So it's distributed as a string in order to evade detection. And it's an encrypted string. And it compiles without ever actually hitting the disk and just lives in memory. So a lot of antivirus has trouble dealing with that. This is a proof of concept, but you can expect to see it because yeah. it's a really good idea. And this is your, the, that's the only innovation. Other than that, it's your garden variety. Encrypt all the files, give you instructions on where to pay and get it, that kind of thing. <laughs> Have you got an Amazon Alexa? Hey, Alexa, order Haribo gummy bears. No, don't do that. Uh, researchers have again uh, hacked Amazon's Alexa to spy on users. So this is, uh, this is really, like, this is actually a feature of the device until Amazon plugged the hole. Well, they, th this was a skill. They call the Alexa apps skills. Eh, it's just one of those marketing buzzwords. And to get a skill on the Alexa store, it must be approved. They did not get this approved. There's no way that Amazon would have ever approved this <laughs> because it did uh, several things. It forced the Alexa to not stop listening and it did some weird hacks so that it could actually... Send us transcription, like, right? Well, it could listen to whole sentences, right? Because the way the Alexa is, it listens word by word and these guys sort of hacked it to take any amount of listening and then it transcribed that and emailed it back to the people that created the skill. So they submitted that to Amazon. It was immediately fixed, but it does, it does go to show you how easy it is to, to turn these things from helpful little gadgets to 
horrible Orwellian listening devices. I'm so glad my mom didn't get one. What if they get the government order to turn it into a horrible Orwellian listening device? Oh, that's an excellent question. Isn't it? <laughs> what's, what's their price? <laughs> Moving right along to the next story. Hackers have built a master key for millions of hotel rooms. So this, uh, this is pretty cool. They've built a little RFID thing here. They found a flaw in the way that these locks work. And the only way to fix it is by updating the firmware on all of the locks currently in service. This is one manufacturer, but a lot of hotels use it. And they were able to, for a given hotel, all you needed was one key. And it could even be an expired key. It didn't have to be an active key. Because, you know, a lot of times you pack up the key with your luggage. You're not thinking about it. You leave. I think they charge your credit card a couple bucks to yeah, make to up for it, it. But it's not a big deal. They don't care because the, the keys expire after a certain amount of time. But even that expired key had the information that they needed once they scanned it to create this master key for the entire hotel. Uh, anything, I think it's Vingcard, built by Swedish lock manufacturer Asa Abloy. I, get, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. 42,000 properties in 166 countries. Woo! Wow. That's a lot of... These guys talk about how much time they put into this. They put years of work into this, and I don't know if they're going to be able to monetize it in any way because they <laughs> no. went right to the manufacturers. But what happened was... One, one of these guys had his laptop stolen from a hotel room. And he, he went to the front desk and he was like, somebody stole my laptop. And obviously they didn't break in. How did they get in? And the hotel was like, ah, we don't even know. And <laughs> so he was like, there must be a way. And he began this research and here's where they, they come to. You know, you're in Airbnb right now. It's just like, yes, that's right. Hotels are insecure. Book on our sites instead. Yeah, because the Airbnb people change the locks after every guest. Oh, they absolutely do. Of course. <laughs> it's very cost effective for some guy who's just renting out a cabin somewhere. Speaking of some people that should change the locks on their DNS service, that was Amazon. Amazon suspicious uh, event has hijacked Amazon traffic for two hours. So this was not actually an Amazon. It was kind of an Amazon problem, but not really. If Amazon correctly implemented DNS sec, I don't think this would have been a problem, but an ISP was hacked. And the hacked ISP was able to hijack traffic bound for Amazon to send it to somewhere to steal cryptocurrency transactions. Yeah, it was a crypto site that was using the Amazon DNS and someone created a perfect copy of it and routed people to that instead. So every transaction made during that time, instead of actually doing the transaction, simply deposited all of those cryptos into a given wallet. That wallet, of course, cryptocurrency, you go, you can just see how much money is in a wallet. It's got millions of dollars in it but they only managed to get 150,000 from this one site hmm. so that's still a lot but people are asking the question the resources you need to pull off an ISP hack at this level are incredible so did they really do it just to hack one site are there other sites we don't know about yet or was this practice <laughs> probably a little bit of both I think it's interesting too that this was uh, the hack the actual ISP that was hacked was Columbus Ohio based ENET which is a large internet service provider in that area, but it was referred to as anonymous system 10297. So uh, it caused Hurricane Electric and possibly Hurricane Electric customers and other ENET peers to send traffic over the same unauthorized routes. So uh, all 1,300 addresses that belong to Route 53 were redirected if you use one of those those ISPs. And it has to do with like BGP, the Border Gateway Protocol, and there, there are ways to secure BGP as well that this ISP should have implemented a long time ago, but you need newer hard, like newer as in not ancient hardware to do it. And a lot of ISPs have not upgraded. The, if you're using a modern browser, you would have gotten the HTTPS warning because the, the certificate did not match. So only people who were like, do it anyway, are the ones that got <laughs> screwed here. So pay attention to that. Uh, speaking of cryptocurrency, NASDAQ is uh can, would consider creating a crypto exchange this is just like jaw on the floor level of news nasdaq like you know isn't that i don't know the most uh, legit financial whatever thing well it's you know the new york stock exchange and the nasdaq those are the big two and so that that so they're saying crypto's legit right I mean, didn't we just That's cover? That's a message that kind of is coming across here. It's, I can't imagine you would do business with it if you thought it was a big scam, <laughs> which a lot of these people have seemed to intimate in the past. Well, you know, I'm really having a hard time drawing a distinction. Like, based on what these companies have said in the past, 
you know, the Colombian drug cartel that HSBC had no idea they were doing business with and cryptocurrency. I mean, it just, it seems like those are on the same level from these guys past press releases. But there's money to be made. Well, there's they, money to be made with right. the Colombian drug cartels. And they did. They went. They did business with them. <laughs> I don't. I don't understand what your argument is here. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're clear. If we can make money, we will do it. We don't care who's on the other side of it. Oh, that's that's too bad because China was just starting to get the message that cryptocurrency was bad, and uh, you know, with the, we've we've had several stories about things happening in China with Bitcoin mining operations and. This is just the latest. 600 computers have been seized by Chinese police for mining Bitcoin. There's not a lot to this story. They say that they were caught because of the sudden surge in demand for electricity and that cryptocurrency mining, there's nothing really wrong with it except that the demand for electricity is well, a it's, burden. It's, yeah, it's too much of a drain on resources in so. different areas. Well, they do certainly have an air pollution problem in China. Yeah. And power generation is one of the big lenders to that. So... I suppose they can make the argument, but was it explicitly against the law? I don't remember ever reading that, that you're not allowed to mine Bitcoins in China. I, I thought, well, the stories that we reported previously is just trading. Like, mining was okay, yeah. but not trading. So, uh, I don't know. <laughs> this In this case, they say that the area had strict controls on the use of electricity and that the use of electricity here was not... Allowed, but I have a hard time believing that a 600 computer mining operation just sprung up overnight. Well, maybe that's when they first know. Maybe there's like a threshold. And it's like too how, much electricity in this sector. How bad do you think was the hit on these guys' social media score? <laughs> it's, you know, it's untold. But they didn't really, you know, they didn't offer insincere apologies or. <laughs> we don't know. It's so low that if they jaywalk just one more time, they're going to be disappeared. <laughs> Smoke in public, they're going to be executed. <laughs> and so I, th I wonder if China's going to change its stance once they learn that even Goldman Sachs is getting in on the crypto game. Goldman Sachs has just hired crypto, trainer, uh, crypto Tra trader Justin Schmidt, I have no idea who that is, to lead the, the digital assets. The, this article kind of name drops this Justin Schmidt character, and it's like, I don't, I don't know who he is. Like, Did they go into that much? I well, he's 38, and he's joined the securities division in New York as vice president. Wow, a VP at 38. I mean, but people, what's, that's nice. Well, he's got a you know a bunch of uh, companies. I, if you were in the business world, that would probably mean something to you. But the big story isn't Justin Schmidt. <laughs> who cares who he is? The big story is, you know, Lloyd Blankfein said terrible, terrible things about Bitcoin. <laughs> and really just doubled down. Time, press release after press release, just shit all over it. And now it's like, oh, you know what? Oh, we'll, we'll put somebody in charge of that. Well, what happened was that guy didn't talk to Galvin Cohen because Galvin Cohen said in this press release, well, in response to client interest, it's not us, it's client interest, in various digital products, we are exploring how best to serve them in the space. This is the company that had to pay fines <laughs> because they were advising their customers to take the other side of their trades. So like they, their trading desk was going one way on a trade and they were advising their customers to take the other side of that trade so they could sell <laughs> or buy or you know whatever they they got fined for that. So of course they have their customers interest in you know that's the big thing, right? <laughs> it's about the customers. It's not about making money. So what you what you what are are you suggesting that they're going to use cryptocurrency as a vehicle to separate customers from their money? That is not what I'm suggesting. <laughs> I need my social media score, so I'll refrain from saying anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know. If, I don't know if things are ever going to get dicey if I have to visit mainland China. No, probably not. It's probably fine. What if you do, though? <laughs> that's, that's it for, uh, for us for the week. We're just going to contemplate our awfulness, and maybe that that's, will improve our social score. That's not it for us for the week. Uh, it's until Friday. Which is part of the week. Oh, yeah, yeah. well, I guess. It's that's a day true. that ends in a <laughs> Friday, we got coming up... Uh, well, just a, a, a morsel of gaming and uh, AI robots. A crumb of design. <laughs> Literally one article. And <laughs> nonsense. The usual nonsense. We've got, no, I think we've got a bumper crop of nonsense this week. There's, there's some good stuff in there. It should be a lot of fun. Yeah. See you Friday. Bye.